This year, the Graduate School of Management is going to turn 25. Uh, we started in 1981. We welcomed our first class of MBA students. And we, this, this occasion tonight seems to be a fitting way to kick off our 25th year as a business school. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of what we have accomplished in 25 years. And um, I'm looking forward to celebrating with th this accomplishment with all of you over the next uh, year, year and a half. I am a per personally a founding member of this faculty, and since the beginning, we've always been very focused on turning ideas into action, taking the ideas of the classroom and turning it into uh, business practices in our community. Um, and another way of thinking about it is taking theory and knowledge from the classroom and, uh, and applying them to applications in the real business world. And we teach this in many ways in, in the GSM through our MBA students uh, through here on campus have field experiences. In, uh, they uh, they uh, are in Sacramento and the Bay Area. Um, we, we teach PhD students uh, who are learning how to commercialize the world-class research that they do in the labs here on this campus. And our undergraduate uh, uh, met technology management minors, we give them a little bump up in their first jobs out in the business world so that they understand something about the, the business context in which their, their science and engineering educations um, uh, have, uh, have taken them. And one of the ways that we foster the principle of ideas into action is by bringing corporate leaders uh, to uh, campus who can share their experiences and their insights with us. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and this last year, we've had quite an extraordinary lineup of people. Uh, these people have included Bill Sullivan, who's the president and CEO of Agilent Technologies. And Bill is also a UC Davis alum. He's, a, he's an Aggie. Bob Eckert, the chairman and CEO of Mattel. Uh, and Peter Klein, former senior vice president of Gillette. And tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome John Morgridge, who is the chairman of the board of Cisco Systems. John joined Cisco in 1988 as president and CEO. And during his tenure, Cisco has become the world's largest network equipment supplier with more than $20 billion in revenues and some 34,000 employees in 65 countries. As chairman of the board, John continues to champion a range of education, philanthropy, and corporate citizenship initiatives. And he's going to talk about some of those tonight. He's also a guiding force behind the company's long-term commitment to focusing on basic human needs, on responsible citizenship, and access to education. And John and his wife, Tasha, personally support a range of education, conservation, and human services initiatives. John ser serves as a very busy man, and he serves on the boards of CARE, the Nature Conservancy, Business Executives for National Security, the uh, University of Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, and the Cisco Foundation, uh, and, the uh, and the Cisco Learning Institute. So John, I want to take, uh, thank you very much for taking time to speak to us on important issues, uh, speak to our campus uh, and our business community. Um, we are, uh, we are we're delighted you can join us, and uh, thank you very much for, for making this possible. John Morgan. Thank you. You know, the beauty of, uh, of universities is that uh, they, uh, the students don't know what they can't do. And of course, you've had a couple of recent examples. I'm a trustee at Stanford, and so I, <laughs> I would cite at least two, and I was informed three occasions where Students who didn't know what they couldn't do did it anyway. <laughs> and you know, that's, that's one of the really great attributes of uh, 
of teaching and research universities. They, they have that unique quality of uh, a lot of cheap labor that uh, is willing to work on ideas that other people don't think are worthy of working on. And as a result, have been a real driving force in the economy of this country and have given us perhaps the real competitive edge that we've had at least during the last uh, 20 or 30 years uh, of our existence. And perhaps no better example than right here in California with the, uh, the uh, whole technology boom that uh, has taken place here. Basically, uh, with people trained and uh, stimulated in the great research universities that exist here. Uh, but that's not the topic of my talk. Incidentally, you can stay as long as you want. However, I'm leaving at 7.30. So. <laughs> Usually, it's the other way around. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk on a, a number of different subjects, but I'm going to kick off on this idea of principled leadership. And, uh, you know, I think it's an interesting uh, query as to what creates principled leaders. Why, how do they come about? And, uh, you know, in my business experience, I would say that there are a number of factors that influence it. But certainly observation, particularly of a mentor, is key to developing that. And I've seen that in our own company. And our current president, John Chambers, would admit to such. I can remember uh, the first time I uh, approached him on a, he, he loves to tell this story uh, about a donation. He said, oh, of course. And then I told him the amount, which turned out to be about 10% of his net worth, which he thought was perhaps excessive. But that's how uh, people learn. That's how they, they observe and uh, they watch and they develop those, uh, uh, their, their own set of standards as a result of that. And certainly at our company, uh, John not only observed, but he carried it on to the next step in terms of his own personal becoming a role model for the company going forward. Uh, now, where do the principal values come from other than observation? Uh, I don't know that this is a definitive study. It was a study done at, uh, at Stanford in the business school of about two dozen, about 25 uh, Silicon Valley CEOs. And it was an a in-depth interview uh, of the CEOs, uh, trying to explore where their set of their moral compass came from. How did it develop? And they listed a, uh, they, they came away with a number of observations as a result of that. And I'm not saying that this is scientific, but I think it, it, it is real in terms of reflecting kind of how these things evolve. Uh, not surprisingly, parents are, are one of those influences. Uh, and mostly, I think, again, not so much by what they say, because we always ignore that as children, but by what they do, by observing how they act. And, you know, I've learned in business that the same is true, that, that people are always watching the leadership and it is not what the leaders say, it is how the leaders act, what the leaders do, that really uh, has the influence. So parents, certainly number one. Certainly the community, the sense of community. And in the particular set, and I'm not saying this is universal, but in the particular set uh, of uh, 25, strangely enough, many of them came from the Midwest. Uh, and... <laughs> I was one of them, by the way. Uh, many of them came from the Midwest, and many of them came from relatively small communities. They may have been a suburb, but they didn't live in the big city, as it were. They, they came from the community, and the sense of community 
and the, 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 uh, the culture of that community actually influenced and, and helped set their compass. And certainly that was my experience. The community I, I lived in, uh, the standards that, that were set and expected. Uh, I'm sure, I don't know how many of you have read uh, General Powell's book, but certainly sense of community in his life was very important in setting his moral compass. The fact that his aunts and uncles and his neighbors down the street knew what he was up to and would report on him if they thought it was in, inappropriate. And it's that, it, you know, in my own case, it was uh, the doctor next door. Uh, his son happened to be my good friend, but, but he was always observing. He was always looking what John Moore, we lived right next door, he was always observing what John Morgridge was doing. Education. You know, in your life, you only make probably a half dozen to a dozen critical life direction decisions. Uh, you've made one, you selected this school. You selected uh, UC Davis. It will have a, a major impact on your life going forward. Your first job may well have an impact. The area of study that you're in will have a major impact. Uh, if you find, find uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, selecting a spouse, major decision. All of those are, are really major life decisions, and there aren't a lot of them. There aren't as many as you would think, uh, but there are a number of them. And certainly where you, where you went to school and the culture and uh, that, that environment has a lot of impact. Uh, we were talking earlier, and certainly in my, in my life, early work experience. And I'm talking about early. I'm talking about when I was 12 years old and had a paper out uh, when I was 14 and worked at the Teeny Weeny Pea Factory. Uh, when I was 16 and I worked at a rock quarry, uh, 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 digging rock and hauling rock with a bunch of Italian stone cutters that uh, really knew how to put in a hard day <laughs> and made sure I did. Uh, uh, all of those are, are uh, a, a very formulating experience, and it's really a shame that in today's world, for whatever reason, kids really don't have that same experience. Uh, I know that on our uh, college applications, uh, we force some, uh, but I don't know that they're the same kind of experience that, uh, that uh, my generation was treated to. And uh, maybe we've lost it. If you grew up on a farm, certainly you experience it. Uh, you experience a lot of those things. But there aren't many farms anymore. So most of us uh, don't live on farms. And so we don't get that kind of uh, shaping and understanding of work and uh, the importance of doing a good job. But certainly in the study that was done of these 25 ex executives, uh, all of these factors were uh, important in terms of shaping uh, uh, their uh, kind of their standards, their ethical standards, uh, not only as from a corporate standpoint, but also from an individual standpoint. The, there are a couple others that were in the study. Uh, Carol Bartz, uh, uh, who is, uh, happen, is head of Autodesk uh, and also happens to be on our board, and Jim Morgan. Uh, she's from Wisconsin, by the way, uh, and Jim Morgan, who grew up on a dairy farm in upstate New York, uh, now chairman of Applied Materials and president there for a long time, and John Chambers, who grew up in West Virginia uh, and uh, certainly had a lot of uh, early life experiences that uh, helped, uh, helped shape uh, you know, his set of standards. Uh, all of these, uh, and, and quite frankly, in terms of a corporate environment and, and a university environment, uh, each has its own kind of culture. And remember, culture is basically beliefs and behavior. Beliefs and behavior. And those are shaped. They'll, they'll happen without direction. Uh, every, every institution has a culture. Uh, 
Some of them are just randomly created. Often they reflect the early leadership of the company. Uh, and they may be as uh, trivial as the fact that at Cisco Systems, uh, we provide free soda pop, any of you looking for jobs, uh, who have a sweet tooth. We also have fruit juice for the health addict, addicts. And then, of course, we try and uh, keep the cost down by pushing water at everyone because it comes at 11 cents a one of these bottles. And, you know, soft drinks are 50 and fruit juice is 73. Uh, and not only that, you know, water you can drink the second day. Yeah, with a lot of the, uh, we, we actually had a CEO, a CFO, Larry Carter, I was up hunting with him. He used to go around at the close of the day and walk through the offices and he would be hoisting all of the soft drink cans and saying, eh, 35 cents, <laughs> quarter, dime. <laughs> And we actually, uh, you know, we took a step. We, we used marketing, and if you walk into our break rooms now, we have a huge cooler full of water. And then next to it, we have one cooler with all the soft drinks in it. And uh, it's amazing. Uh, we've actually cut $100 a year off the drink costs. <laughs> by pushing, no, by pushing water. And there's very little downside other than cleaning the bathrooms more often. That's assuming that you, you assume that the individual is thinking about business walking to and from uh, that facility. Uh, but culture, culture, as I said, comes from a lot of different places. And you can actually shape culture. Uh, and in, in today, today's world, there are a lot of tools that can do that. You know, if you looked at IBM in the 1980s even, uh, it was really a, uh, a collection of individual companies. IBM Japan was not the same as Ar uh, IBM Argentina. IBM Argentina was far different than IBM Germany. IBM Germany was different from France, of course. And, uh, and so it went. There were a lot of different cultures. Uh, with the internet and uh, verbal communication, you can now create uh, relatively universal cultures across cultures. Uh, you do it in two ways. One is communications. The fact that if I'm in Tokyo, I can get the news every bit as quickly as if I'm in San Jose. I am not a deprived citizen. I'm not uh, someone that they don't want to know. They actually tell me what's going on on a real-time basis. And the second is that through establishing a series of processes, you actually develop a standardized culture. We do 360s. Uh, everyone knows what a 360 is. That's a, a total review of an individual. We do 360s all over the world. That's a cultural attribute of the company. It, it says something about the, uh, the culture. Uh, every Monday morning, every sales rep, every place in the world forecasts the business that they're going to close that week. That's a process that, in effect, transmits a certain cultural aspect with it. Uh, you can go on down the list, finance, uh, HR, uh, manufacture, all of those through the, through the network using a standardized set of tools and processes, procedures, you actually transmit a, a set uh, of uh, uh, a certain uh, culture. Now, this is, uh, this is a listing of our culture. The interesting thing about this is that while some of it has changed a little bit as in terms of uh, the wording, these back actually go back to the early 90s, this set of uh, cultural attributes. And you might ask, well, where do they come from? And you know, it is interesting to look at where, where they come from. Uh, some of them you can actually identify. The, you see up there the uh, uh, frugality. 
Frugality came from our founders, you know. We were a company that was not a VC startup. We were funded by second mortgages and uh, credit cards. Uh, to some degree, even Stanford's credit cards until they got fired off the campus. Uh, but it, it, was that, that was, it, it was a very frugal environment. And uh, uh, as a result, we were profitable very early because if we didn't have the money, we didn't pay people. I mean, it was a very straightforward, it was a cash accounting kind of a business. And uh, so I can, I can point to where that came from. Uh, I can point to where this, this came from. And it was not the founders, this was the employees. We moved into a new building early in our life across the street from a school. And, Lo and behold, the employees started climbing the fence, and I followed them over the fence, and pretty soon we adopted the school, and when we uh, moved into bigger quarters, they got all our, you can still go there and see our old conference tables, and you know, our old desks, they, they took it all. Uh, so it, it started very, uh, this, this idea of giving back uh, started very, very early in the company's history. And the rest of them, uh, the same. Now, a lot of companies publish these kinds of uh, statements. What you really need to do is listen to the stories that are told. It's not what is published on the card. That's good, because it lets everyone know what we're, what we're about. But it's the stories that are told. And one story I'll share. Uh, our competitor who claimed to be cheap, when he uh, used to go to New York, he always rented a limousine. So when I went to New York, of course, I never rented a limousine. And uh, the sales staff loved to take me on the subway. And I, you know, when you come into town, what they like to do is they like to start you at 7.30 and drive you right through until about 9.30. Really, really wear them out. Show them how hard we work. Of course, they probably don't come in the next day, and I go on to another city and do the same thing. Uh, so anyway, I was in town. They'd run me up and down. I Finally, we ended up on Wall Street. And I don't know if you've ever been on Wall Street, but when you come out of Morgan Stanley or so on, there are all these limousines lined up. So they had all these limousines lined up, and they either have a number or a name on them. I came out, came out of the door, I was the first one out. Right in front was a limousine with my name on it. You know, mortgage is not a common name. So I walk up to the guy, I said, uh, I'm John Mortgage. He reaches in the pocket, he says, here's a subway token. <laughs> the entrance is right down there at the end of the block. Now, those are the kind of stories that create culture and tell the, the, the theory uh, uh, of culture in, uh, in, a, in a company. Uh, oh, this is the school we adopted, C Castaño School. And uh, as I said, it, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> here again, a good story. Uh, this is Marty Hargrove, who is the, was the principal. She isn't anymore, but she was the principal. And I used to go over and be principal for a day. So one day she said, gee, why don't you let me come over and be president for a day? <laughs> so we did that. So I come back at the end of the day. She says, you know, John, I think I like your job better than mine. <laughs> you don't mind if I stay, do you? <laughs> but uh, it, it's been a, a long relationship with that, uh, with that school, and it, it involves uh, a lot of our employees. It's those kinds of examples that set the, set the tone in the culture uh, of a company. These are the major stakeholders, you know, for most companies. And the key to a successful company, and one that has the right standards, is if they treat all of those stakeholders, all of those stakeholders, not just the employees, not just the stockholders, not just the suppliers, not, you know, go down the list. And it's a long list. And it includes a lot of, and it's, it, the, 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 the really great company is well measured by all of the constituents. Because that reflects the real deep culture of the company, the kind of company it is. And we all know examples of that, you know, uh, because sometimes it's reflected by the person that you deal with. 
your impression of an airline is the clerk that's in front of you when you have a problem and how they react to you. And how they react is a reflection of the culture of that institution. What they've been empowered to do. And, uh, you know, early on in our uh, history, like many uh, high-tech companies, we actually sold some products that didn't work. Uh, it's been kind of uh, standard in our industry for a long time. Now, when I say they didn't work, they didn't work in a certain set of circumstances. And uh, so we had pretty much a standard uh, approach. If a customer called and said the equipment was down, uh, first we'd say, oh, really? <laughs> and uh, they'd tell us about the bug, and we'd try and fix the bug. But we empowered our employees that if they couldn't, come up with a solution within a relatively short period of time, just ship them a new product. Just ship them a new product. You are authorized to ship them a new product. Anyone in the company is authorized to ship a new product to a company that's in distress. Now, we might subsequently go back and evaluate why it failed and whether indeed it was our, we wouldn't even ask if it were our fault. If it wasn't working, that's what we did until we, you know, mastered a set of tools. But it speaks to the kind of culture and the empowerment that you give to the people uh, within the organization. And they, they sense it, you know, very quickly as to what they're empowered to do. Uh, I think the important word here is obligation. You know, this is a company that has been very, very successful. Uh, I joined the company in 19... Uh, when was it now? 1988. I was the 35th employee. Today we have probably 37,000 employees. Uh, when I joined the company, we did $5 million. Today we do $24 billion. Uh, that kind of success is not just our success. We didn't create that. We responded to it, but we did not create that, you know. A lot of factors created that. Davis was pro part of it because we have some of your graduates. Um, so as a result, we have an obligation to give back to those that help make us successful. And I think that it's that understanding that's important in a, in a business culture. The fact that, that the leadership sets that standard. You know, uh, I tell our people, as does John Chambers, that we are a community citizen in every, every city and area where we are. Not just in San Jose, where our headquarters is, but everywhere. And that we should respond in that environment that way. We should be a good citizen, uh, because that's our obligation. Uh, I, I know that uh, some of you may be familiar with the fact now that a lot of companies are publishing kind of a citizen report. And it covers everything from uh, product responsibility, uh, uh, the environment, uh, how you treat the environment, certainly employee welfare. I mean, we have a, a wonderful case currently brewing with our friends at Walmart. Uh, Right or wrong, they're perceived, they are perceived as not treating their employees fairly when it comes to health benefits. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but it seems to me that you should not, it should, you, you should develop it in a way and respond to it in a way uh, where the employee thinks that. Because if the employee thinks you're treating them reasonably fairly, on this issue, then the public will not perceive differently, generally. And uh, uh, certainly in our case, and you've got to do it before the fact. You can't do it after the fact. And that gets back to culture. That gets back to leadership. It's got to happen before the fact. You know, we gave back before we were even required to do it. We gave back when we were a small company, where we were below the radar, where no one was measuring us, where no one was asking us about it. And you develop that in the culture, 
And then when you become a big company, it's there. It's not something that you subsequently have to manufacture or create uh, to deal with it. Uh, and we've got a number of things uh, that we've done. I'm a strong believer in th that, that companies and institutions giving back. And institu incidentally, that includes, that includes an institution such as this. You know, this, this institution should think about how they give back to the community. Now, I know they do, you do in a lot of different ways, but the idea is that it shouldn't just be passive. You should actually look at it and assess it. And, and, and think about how, how best you can be effective. And I'm a big believer in capitalizing on what I call the sweet spot. It was a study done by uh, uh, Porter at Harvard on this idea of, of picking the sweet spot between the business objectives and the giving back or philanthropic objectives. And what that says is that what you want to do, and it forces this to some degree, is that it's got to be in both interests. It's got to respond to both interests. And the reason for that is twofold. One is that only then is it really sustain sustainable. You know, if our president happened to go to UC Davis, he might well have a fond spot in his heart, and we as a corporation might do something extraordinary for Davis. But I can guarantee you it only lasts until he's replaced by a guy who went to MIT or a woman that went to the University of Wisconsin. And then guess what? It goes somewhere else. If you want to sustain it, then it's got to be in both people's best interests. And the other thing that that causes is it causes you to capitalize on all of your assets. You know, if you look back at corporate philanthropy historically, much of it was really capitalizing on a limited set of the corporate assets, generally cash, generally cash, either cash or product. And corporations have a lot of additional talent that they can apply in, uh, in uh, giving back. Uh, not the least of which is, uh, is their uh, human capital. Now if you're going to capitalize on human capital, then what you want to do, then, then if you're looking at your business sweet spot, guess what? It plays to their capabilities. It plays to the capabilities of your employees because that's the business they're in. They understand that business. They can be effective in it. And, uh, you know, uh, really a kind of a stroke of luck was our, uh, our networking academy program, which capitalized on a lot of our business a uh, assets. And uh, that's a program where we developed a curriculum to teach uh, technology, networking to standards, and uh, 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 then we expanded it to a whole uh, additional s uh, series of courses, some supported by Sun, Adobe, uh, HP, on technology, taught in high schools, taught in community colleges, and in most of the world other than the United States and universities. Uh, and universities, uh, you know, we have a, we have a perception that uh, that we can always do it better. And uh, so there's uh, some hesitation to accept uh, outside curriculum. Uh, but suffice to say that it capitalized on a tremendous number of our assets. It, uh, all of our knowledge, we could involve our, our uh, personnel. We're in 100, uh, as you'll see in a minute, we're in 170 some countries. So it didn't matter where you were in the world. You could. You could, uh, our employees could be involved. Uh, it uh, leveraged off our equipment, leveraged off our, our systems, involved some cash, involved partnering, uh, reflected all of our, a lot of our internal processes. You know, we're process oriented. We do a lot of measurement. We did a lot, of, we 
do a lot of testing in this program. We test every week. Every five sessions, the students get a test. There's an immediate feedback. All of those things are part of our kind of business culture. And it's incorporated. We naturally incorporated it in, in, uh, in this program. Some of the others uh, you know, reflect the, the same uh, kind of thing. Uh, this actually is a program that was driven by necessity when we had our first layoff. We created uh, Cisco Fellows. We said uh, that uh, some of the laid off employees could stay on the Cisco uh, payroll at a reduction in salary and go to work for a nonprofit for a year with the option of coming back and they would maintain all of their benefits and their stock options. The program was so successful and as you might imagine, they took all of our processes into the food bank and into care and into uh, a whole series, about a dozen uh, different uh, org nonprofit organizations. It was so successful that we've continued it and it gives back to us in the form of our employees gaining an understanding of, of those uh, undertakings. Um, the Academy program actually started in, uh, in uh, 97 uh, where we tested the curriculum right here in San Francisco. Uh, as it says, we're now at some uh, 9,700 institutions in 165 countries. Now what that means is that they have a Cisco Academy that teaches our curriculum which is delivered off a PC, off a server, downline loaded off of our network, which we uh, enabled for them, stores all the materials. Uh, and we've learned a lot about education as a result of it. The benefit to us, we dominate the education market because it gave us a legitimate entry. You know, when I go call, or uh, John Chambers goes calls on the president of a country and he says, why don't you build a plant here? Why don't you invest in my country? Guess what the answer is? We're already investing here. We're training your people. We have X number of academies in your schools training your people. And so there's a payback and it's, it's uh, been very successful. It's probably our most successful marketing campaign. And we never intended it that way, quite frankly. It just, it just turned out that way. These are some of the statistics you can see. We do a lot of testing. <laughs> uh, and we've got a lot of students. We've, uh, we've graduated over a million. They've gone through four semesters of this and we've got about a half million currently enrolled around the world. Uh, and we're everywhere. And you can see the number of institutions and the fact that uh, it's, been a, it's been a uniquely, uh, it's been a unique way of giving back. A very unique way of giving back. And we've leveraged off that. We, we were successful in that, so John Chambers committed to, to take technology to Jordan. And uh, our, you can see we have a bunch of other partners, which is incidentally one of the other things that's been interesting about giving back is you get involved in a lot of institutions that you might normally not be involved in. You get into all different parts of the, of the world community uh, that uh, a lot of businesses never touch, but by giving back, you're part of it. And uh, there's, there's a repayment in that. Uh, this is a program, a math program, where we uh, put an online math curriculum, K-12. It uh, was developed by their, uh, by their uh, instructors, 80 of them came together to write the curriculum. We've rolled it out now in about 100 schools in Jordan, and as they network their schools, they'll, they'll expand that. Uh, the, uh, as a result of that, uh, guess what? Uh, we decided to get involved in the schools in Mississippi. And we're going to, uh, uh, again, we've committed $40 million uh, to what we call the 21st Century School Initiative, uh, $20 million of which will be spent in uh, Mississippi uh, at uh, 32 schools, 7 districts, uh, and many of the, in, in the community, in the, uh, uh, small town schools will actually network the community. Now, is there a payback to us? Absolutely. Absolutely, there's a payback. Uh, these are great models that we can, uh, we can market uh, 
to other communities. But uh, it's a great, it's a great uh, way of giving back to these people who have, have, uh, have uh, faced a, a terrible disaster. Uh, the other thing is, and this gets back to, to leading by example. You know, very early on, uh, uh, this company, this this company's been very good to my wife and I, to our family. Very early on, I started matching employee giving, and uh, you can see the kind of results that you get when you stimulate your employees leading by example. Uh, you can see the new partners that we have developed. We had actually we've had. Uh, We've had uh, fellows at Save the Children, Catholic Relief, Oxfam, uh, not World Vision, not the Red Cross. But we've, been, we've actually had fellows at these institutions so that we have a, relation, a relationship with them. We actually developed uh, this communications, this portable communications kit. We did it with a thing called Net Hope, which we helped establish which now contains 17 international NGOs. And two years ago, they said, we've got to have a mobile, mobile communications system. We sat down, we designed this one that comes in a suitcase, sets up a local network, has a satellite uh, capability, and guess what? When this happened six months later, we deployed them, and we deployed them with these partners. Uh, we've also uh, deployed them I I as part of uh, 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 Katrina. Uh, and you can see, again, a uh, big match. This all in one year, incidentally. Uh, and our employees involved. You know, these kinds of responses by employees are the result of the fact that the culture of the company says, this is what we expect you to do. This, this is... This is what we're about. And that's why culture is so important uh, in, in a company. Uh, here again, uh, they dis uh, dispatch five of these as part of uh, Katrina. And as I said, we, we had them available because we had, we had created, them, uh, created them in advance. Uh, this happens to be Pakistan, uh, you know, the third uh, tragedy in a row. Uh, that occurred, and uh, again we responded. Right now we're in uh, we're in our uh, second harvest drive. This we started. Uh, I started uh, way back in the early 90s, uh, and uh, we started out locally because the local food bank was great. So we got involved with the local food bank. We actually had a fellows, fellows at the local food bank to redo their accounting and communication system. Uh, as a result of having a long time, 14 year experience with them, started out locally, then took it nationally, now we're worldwide. And here again, you know, the, this kind of a culture is not necessarily endemic in Japan or China or in Scandinavia or in the UK. Often they look to government to do this. They expect government to do that. They don't feel that it's either part of business's responsibility or their personal responsibility. But you can change that. You can change that over, over, uh, over time. Well, it is now, uh, my, fa my watch is three minutes fast. You have five minutes for questions. <laughs> I should have gone just a little longer. Then there wouldn't have been any questions. Now, normally there aren't any questions unless you planted a question. Did we plan a question? Uh, no. We should have. Please come up and use this. Now, here, you can use this. Since you're right here in front. Thank you very much. It was very yeah. interesting. In your uh, conversations with the board of directors at Cisco, when you come to making decisions about contributions and these value kinds of judgments, how do you develop a consensus and what becomes important in that discussion? That is the one problem with this idea of the sweet spot. Because what board of directors then asks, OK, Give me the measures of the impact on our business of your philanthropy. 
Now, we have some measures. I can tell you, sir, that we are in 98.5 of the congressional districts in the United States. What's that worth? What impact does that have? I can tell you, sir, that when, we, when John Chambers called on uh, Tony Blair, the first question he asked was, we love your networking academies. Can you do the same thing in medicine for us? So, you know, and, and we've sold a lot of equipment. You know, we've sold a lot of equipment. There is equipment involved in the academies. We've given a lot of equipment, but they've bought a lot of equipment. More importantly, the schools have bought a, a lot of equipment. More importantly, when, you go, when we go in and call on a on the state uh, head of education, normally you'd say, yeah, you're in here peddling. Oh, no, sir, we're not in here peddling. We're in here to talk about our network academies in the state of California, where we have 346 of them. And how can we better, how can we better uh, develop that program to impa impact the students of, of this state so that they're prepared for, for uh, the technology revolution? So, but it is a question we get asked as a result of trying to hit the sweet spot. They say, okay, tell me what the business impact is. What does it mean and how do you measure it? One other question. Actually, I guess we could have two. Uh, hello, thank you for the courtesy of coming here. Um, I'm a long in the tooth graduate student at the Institute of Transportation Studies. Um, uh, maybe one hot button question and perhaps the reason you should have gone longer. Uh, the issue specifically of outsourcing and you know countryhood and nationhood and borders and things like that with capital mobile and product mobile, but people not, and you know some of the dislocations. How does it? Here's a specific question to your kind of general presentation on values. Thank you. Well, uh, of course, outsourcing has always has been around forever. And uh, the thing I think that has changed is the speed of of uh, the mobility of moving. Uh, and what it says really is that any country that chooses not to invest in education will be at a severe disadvantage in the future. Because uh, to some degree business is going to go where the best minds are. You know, uh, I can remember early on uh, looking at a cheap place to put our accounts payable and accounts receivable organization. And we looked at city, they had, the cities had to be within an hour's plane ride. Uh, so it was Salt Lake at the time, it was Phoenix, it was uh, some uh, Portland maybe. Or, and what you find out is that that might be a good decision at one point in time, but five years later it was immaterial because the mobility and the change takes place. Uh, certainly, we will be responsive to the markets of the world. We do, we do business in China, we do business in Japan. We're expected to be involved there. Every time John Chambers goes there, he says, they ask, are you going to put a, a research facility here? Are you going to put a, a, a factory here? Uh, I go to the state of Wisconsin. The government, governor asked me the same questions. Uh, and the answer to those questions is that we are going to, we're going to put our facilities where the brightest and most capable people are. And that's why we're in Silicon Valley because there are a lot of them there and we attract them from all over the world. I hope we continue to do that because it's been a real competitive advantage for us. You know, we, we take not only the best of the United States, but we take the best of the world. They come here to this campus and they stay. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, I, I think that if, if, uh, if business sets its standards uh, at a level where they're responsive to uh, uh, human needs irrespective of where they are in the world, which is what we attempt to do, uh, that it can't, be, uh, it can't be viewed negatively. 
And, uh, you know, business in this country lobbies uh, continually. I mean, B Bill Gates is on the road perpetually lobbying on education that we sh need to invest more. But we as a people have to make that decision. We have to decide that we're going to spend it. You know, here in California, you spend, uh, we spend, what, 5200 per student, K-12, something like that, 5700 uh, I think it's pretty clear that you can't run a first-rate, well, we've proven that, you cannot run a first-rate K-12 education institution at that, at that, uh, if that's all you're willing to invest. You've got to invest more. And it doesn't guarantee, you know, there are states that, like New Jersey that spend 10 or 11, and you can question what they get back. There are a lot of other factors, but it starts with investment. It starts with with some uh, meaningful level of investment. That is, that's been our competitive advantage in the future. I think in the next uh, decades, it, it will be the basis of competitive advantage, whoever has it. I don't know if I answered your question, but. I'll accept that, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> One last question. You said that today's youth uh, don't have an opportunity to work on farmhouses to know the value of a good day's job. What can we do now to retrofit that into our lives? You know, that's a tough question because, uh, for this country, because we are so litigious. Uh, you know, I, I would love to have a program at Cisco for high school kids, but it, it, it would be very hard to do. It would be very hard to do. Uh, I do think this, however, and that is I think that we as parents are part of the problem. We as parents are part of the problem. The, the United States generally is as safe or safer than when I was a kid. And when I was a kid, I went everywhere on my bike, and uh, on, in canoes, in cars. You, kids don't do that anymore. The parents won't let them. The parents won't let them. Our grandson is uh, 17. He's a, he's a uh, college bound. Uh, he's a senior. Uh, he wanted to go to Florida. Guess what his mother said? Yes, if I come along. <laughs> Now, who wants to go to Florida with your mother? <laughs> I mean, I went to Florida when I was, I, I, it was before I was 16 because I couldn't drive. And did I get into trouble? Eh, sort of. <laughs> but, so we're part of the problem. You're part of the problem if you're a parent. You know, you won't even let them ride their bicycle to school. You got to drive them. Afraid something might happen. Uh, and uh, that, I think, is, is, I, think, I think the parents have to, to force some of that, or have to permit, have to permit some level of independence. Uh, because that's part of the learning process. Thank you very much. <laughs>